Uh, so welcome everyone to our October Teach Educational Rounds. Here with us today, we have Dr. Abdulaziz Ashhill and Dr. Peter Selby, who, uh, who will be guiding us through a, um, a discussion on complex client cases. So to begin, I'm going to go through KMH's land acknowledgement. KMH is situated on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia. Lands rich in civilizations with knowledge of medicine, architecture, technology, and extensive trade routes throughout the Americas. In 1860, the site of KMH appeared in the Colonial Records Office of the British Crown as the Council Grounds of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, as they were known at the time. Today, Toronto is covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty No. 13 of 1805 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto is now home to a vast diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis who enrich this city. KMH is committed to reconciliation. We will honour the land through programs and places that reflect and respect its heritage. We will embrace the healing traditions of the ancestors and weave them into our caring practices. We will create new relationships and partnerships with First Nations in your MAT and share the land and protect it for future generations. Now I invite everyone to uh, introduce yourself in the chat and let us know which uh, traditional territory you're joining us from today. If you're not sure, I can put um, that website in the chat for you to find out. You're also welcome to let us know something that you're doing to learn or improve your commitment to reconciliation. Now I'll give everyone uh, a couple moments to, to share in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just share about, a bit about myself for those that are joining for the first time. My name is Natalie and like KMH, I'm currently located on, on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I acknowledge the privilege I have as a white settler to live here and be safe and within close proximity to all my daily needs, especially uh, living with type one diabetes. I myself am committed to reconciliation and continue to listen and uplift the stories and voices of various Indigenous communities. So I'll give everyone a few more mo moments to introduce themselves and share in the chat. Welcome everyone. In the meantime, I will continue on with just a few housekeeping items, um, but please do keep sharing in the chat. We'd love to hear your responses. Uh, so if you're interested in receiving a letter of completion for this Teach Educational Rounds, please make sure you've registered for the webinar and completed the pre-learning assessment. As well, make sure you signed into the webinar using your full first name and last name so we can track your participation. And last but not least, make sure to complete the evaluation and post-learning assessment that will be emailed to you by tomorrow. Along with that, everyone that registered will receive a copy of the slides as well as uh, the recording if they would like to review it or share with any uh, colleagues. So here's a little bit more information on our presenters today. First up, we have Dr. Abdulaziz Ashhel. Uh, Dr. Ashhel is a Saudi and Arab board certified family physician. Graduated from King Saud University, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Dr. Ashel was awarded for his outstanding performance during his family medicine residency and for his exceptional contribution to the academic activities. He is currently doing a mental health addiction and addictions fellowship focusing on psychotherapeutic approaches under the supervision of Dr. Peter Selby. Dr. Ashel is interested in behavioral change pertinent to chronic diseases, obesity, and lifestyle medicine. So welcome, Dr. Ashel and uh, no dis disclosures to report on his end. And next up, we have Dr. Peter Selby, who is a senior scientist and senior medical consultant at KMH. He's the vice chair of research for the Department of Family and Community Medicine and holds the Dr. Barnett and Beverly Giblin Professorship in Family Medicine um, at U of T. He's also a professor in the Department of Psychiatry in the Dalana School of Public Health at U of T and a full member of the School of Graduate Studies through the Dalana School of Public Health and the Institute of Medical Sciences at U of T and, and a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. <laughs> Let's go next. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's go. And um, here are his disclosures to report. So I'll give him a few moments to read through those. Uh, so please note that the content of Teach Educational Rounds is centered on evidence-based guidelines from the following sources. Nonetheless, these materials, as well as the verbal uh, presentation and any discussion, represent only general principles and they do not remove the need for clinical assessments or treatment plans by healthcare professionals. 
So please feel welcome to use the chat feature throughout the webinar to post any comments or answer any prompts from the presenters. To do this, you can click on the speech bubble icon in the control panel, and please ensure you select everyone so that all panelists, hosts, and attendees can read and respond to your comments. You're also very welcome to use the reaction feature throughout the webinar if you would like to send a smiley face, a thumbs up at any point. So uh, with that, I will leave it to our presenters to take it away. Thank you everyone and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Natalie. So uh, between Dr. Abdulaziz and myself, we're gonna uh, review the cases and we'll have a discussion and please uh, put your comments in the chat. Um, so really the objectives we wanna, you know, uh, we had asked you to submit cases. We've got six of them. We're gonna go through them quickly. We're gonna uh, make sure that we, uh, we cover the key points of those cases, and uh, really this is to deal with the complexity of, of those lives as they're coming to uh, uh, quit tobacco I, or either have to quit tobacco because of their circumstance, and uh, we're going to talk about how we approach it. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide, and maybe that's the first case. Uh, okay, there we go. Oh, sorry, we both hit the one. All right, do you want to go ahead, uh, Sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Selby. Welcome everyone for joining. And so as just echoing uh, what Dr. Selby mentioned, it's more of a discussion. So feel free to share any thoughts or questions or ideas as we discuss different uh, cases. And again, we try turning cases into learning points as opposed to just, you know, discussing specific uh, cases. So case number one is a client with Wernicke's Korsakov, alcohol-related brain injury with um, memory disturbance, heavy smoker smoking 20 cigarettes per day with a good response on Veriniclin. ODB funding was over in 12 weeks, client relapsed. And then the question is what to do next. So, yeah, um, so maybe, you know, you can talk about uh... You know, for people who may or may not know, Wernicke is so basically when drink, people drink to excess, there's a particular vitamin deficiency, thiamine deficiency that causes the, uh, the brain not to function properly. And so it's characterized by, you know, uh, ataxia or difficulty walking, they're tremulous, they also have uh, difficulty with their eyes, their eyes have nystagmus, they move, and they have this very particular kind of memory impairment called Korsakov. Uh, whereby uh, they they confabulate because they have these gaps and they can't fill those gaps and so they make up stories. So so that that is roughly that overarching issues because alcohol is as you know is a very bad uh, uh, chemical for the brain. It's a class one carcinogen, but beyond that, it also is very neurotoxic. Um, and so you have these people who get into this trouble. The good thing is that if it's caught early, it's reversible and they need to be on time and immediately, but uh, and, and IV time, and then you'll see this reverse. But um, so that's the basis of when a case course ago. But um, Dr. Abdusi, do you want to talk about how you would approach this particular person now that you know they've back to smoking, they relapse? What's next? Yeah. So as 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 we know, uh, the client has ended his um, varenicline coverage. So maybe going back and starting. Uh, spending time with the client, finding what's difficult for them in terms of memory and considering other options that can help with memory and maybe going back and considering NRT in general uh, in that situation. Yeah, NRT could be an option if obviously through STOP in Ontario, certainly that becomes a possibility. Uh, but again, if you don't have that, you know, one of the things that we've realized is that actually uh, verniclin uh, is can be bought generically and depending on the means um, and the pharmacy, you can probably get it at a fairly reduced price. And there is evidence to be on Verniclin for at least up to 26 weeks, especially if they've had a good response or some studies to show that. But in this case particular, you know, a case could be even made for extending it. I've had some people on Verniclin for up to a year um, because you know, the risks of them going back to smoking in this case, especially if they have memory issues uh, or cognitive impairment, they are high risk of, you know, having fires or burning themselves or things like that. So, so that becomes an option, right? And uh, so NRT or uh, continuing the ventricle, 
And last but not the least, as a you know, extremely you know, uh, uh, your your last option is if if fire you know fire hazard is a risk because of the alcohol related brain injury and you know there's no other option, nicotine replacements not working, um, uh, is not working, and or no interest or you know a vaping device, uh, single use vaping devices might be appropriate but you have to be careful because if they don't have a lockout they can land up you know there's no a visual cue on how much they're getting so they could land up overdose so you have to be careful if you're going to use some sort of vaping device in this patient population but at least it's not a fire risk um all right uh any any thoughts uh be appropriate uh uh be appropriate not a good idea in this situation because of the seizure risk but Again, if there are no seizures and it hasn't been tried, you can try bupropion uh, because ODB funding, interestingly, is 12 weeks for Verniclin and 12 weeks for bupropion, whether they take those two together or sequentially. So you could technically get coverage uh, for, for that whole time. Um, now, you cannot apply for extended co co coverage. There's no way to apply for extended coverage for Verniclin, as we know now with the ministry. Uh, but it really becomes, um, you know, finding other means to pay for it through family, through um, discretionary funds on their, on, on their uh, uh, you know, on their disability income, et cetera. So it depends on the situation uh, or out of pocket pay. Um, all right. Um, next, where do we go to the next uh, case? I can go to the next one. All right. Can everybody see it? Is it showing up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead, uh, Dr. Lewis. Yeah. So uh, our second case is a 64 year old uh, who smokes one pack since the age of 20, hypertensive, dyslipidemic with a BMI of 29.8, no current physical activity, no diet, and drinks more than 40 standard drinks a week. So this client basically tried going cold turkey and that helped uh, for four years, relapsed later, tried vaping, did not like it for taste reasons, and then tried heated tobacco, was able to completely shift to heated tobacco 100%, and then approaching this uh, moment, having split decisions based on a long CT that showed um, a dark spot. Uh, a repeat CT, the client has split decision based on lung CT results. If positive, has uh, smoking cessation at 10 out of 10 importance. If not, then a lot less important with a confidence of 7.5. Yeah, so how, how would you like, how do you, would you approach this person? So in this situation, I would actually spend more time doing um, more motivational interviewing because I see a lot of things happening like no diet, no exercise, um, overweight, alcohol is out of control. So I think more motivational interviewing just to get an idea of what's uh, happening and just elaborate more on behavioral changes and maybe get more planning and focusing in terms of motivational interviewing. Yeah. Uh I agree. I mean, this person has, and it's also, you know, in the case they said, the more you push him, the more, you know, resistant or more uh, obstinate the person can become. And, and, and again, the drinking is, you know, 40 standard drinks a week. That's, that's a fair number. Um, so again, in addition, you know, maybe doing the motivation, doing, doing the, you know, doing the bubble sheet with them to see what's the their understanding of the association with drinking, smoking, their uh, BMI being high, the hypertension, um, you know, all of those, uh, uh, and obviously the lung issues. Uh, how do they make sense of it? Uh, again, you know, in, in, in people like this who tend to have these kinds of things, uh, we also pay attention to trauma because childhood trauma is interesting. We, there's an A score greater than 10 is correlated with all these, these health behaviors in adult life. And it, you have to be careful because depending on his 
his personality. He may or may not want to be talking about it, but you could be assured that this person has been through a lot, um, uh, especially with what they're doing. So, so simply trying to yank off the drinking, yank off the smoking without uh, understanding what's underlying it would, would not be successful. So would, now let's put that, that, that would happen in the therapeutic side as to what's going on uh, with them, but behaviorally and, and pharmacologically, uh, you have some options. So, you know, are there any medication options? So let's say, okay, you're going to do the motivation interview and getting him closer to, to wanting to try. Um, but here's the issue here. He's, he's done heat, you know, heat, not burn tobacco. So we've talked about that in previous ones. Heat, not burn tobacco is basically a tobacco stick. It's, in between a cigarette and a vaping device because it still heats tobacco and you still get something, but in the harm reduction, uh, you know, scheme of things, it falls in between smoking and, uh, and a vaping device. So, you know, how would you approach this if he doesn't want to quit and if he does want to quit? Let's say the CT scan results come back and he says he's 100% wants to quit. Uh, what are some of the medication options that you would use? Yeah, I would consider starting off with Champix or Veronicline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know one of the things with Champix or Veronicline, which people you know often uh, don't necessarily know, but it can happen, is that actually it can interfere with people's tolerance to alcohol, which means they become very sensitive to alcohol. And in fact, in some cases, they even stop drinking altogether. So there may be that addition. I mean, it's a mixed, the, the evidence is mixed about the effects on drinking, but we do know it's a, it's kind of a caution uh, in the mono, monograph that if people are drinking heavily, that they should be advised that that when they when they take Vernaclin, that they could, you know, they could, uh, they could develop, uh, 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 they lose their tolerance to alcohol and get very intoxicated. So it's extremely important for them to know that. Um, the other thing is, um, I don't know what your thoughts are, but, uh, screening for depression and anxiety, because there could be underlying depression, and anxiety that's not been treated on, you know, he's been self-medicating with alcohol and cigarettes and eating. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the trauma part in this case. Absolutely. There's, uh, there must be something going on in the background in terms of mental health. So mm -hmm. absolutely, um, the screening for depression, anxiety, any other personality traits, uh, yeah. I mean, all over in general. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the usual, you know, is somebody else smoking at home and, and of course he's tried vaping, doesn't like it. So that's not an option, but it's still important to know which device they use, you know, because there's so many devices and it's important to know what they didn't like about it. I mean, were they expecting they weren't it wasn't replacing the nicotine requirements it wasn't facing the throat hit that they were looking for or the sensory experience of seeing uh, an aerosol in front of them so it's so i when somebody says they've tried something and not like it i often find out what they tried how long they tried it for what was it that they didn't like and even if they didn't like it did it actually work uh, so you know trying to figure those kinds of things out are important you know we don't know whether he tried vaping with the candy flavor and, and because he went to the heat not burn and it had a menthol or it had a mint flavor that helped him make the transition. So it's important to know what, what happened. Um, so again, like, you know, what else can we have? Let's say he doesn't want to quit completely right away. What are some of the other options you know, that you would use with you know, given that we don't have um, you know, let's say Verniclin is not an option for him, or he's not doesn't want to take it, and he's not ready to quit. What are some of the other things that we could do uh, to help him? Yeah, so other option would be NRT, or maybe if if he's considering, you know, changing his drinking pattern, maybe adding naltrexone and Verniclin. Yeah. yeah, I think in the chat, James Brown has said uh, that that. If he's interested, you could add less check. So, I mean, the main thing is to make sure that this person doesn't have acute alcohol withdrawal happening. So it would take a little bit more of a detailed history to say, you know, 
how long can you go without a drink? Do you get shaky when you don't drink? You know, all of those kinds of things. Because if he has withdrawal, you know, if you put him in an naltrexone, you may precipitate a withdrawal in him from alcohol. And then it'll be hard to know what's alcohol withdrawal, what's nicotine withdrawal, what's, you know, mixed. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good option. Um, interestingly enough, for, you know, naltrexone is also used for weight loss and it would, in combination with bupropion. Uh, but in smoking cessation, the combination of naltrexone with NRT tends to pre prevent weight gain primarily in women, not so much in men. So, so I think that's, you know, I think naltrexone is a good thing to consider, but primarily it, if it, anything, it's going to affect the drinking, not necessarily anything else. Uh, but to do that, you need to make sure they get a blood test done, make sure their liver function tests are okay. And then, of course, uh, monitor them on the naltrexone. Um, there's also, uh, Lisa mentioned, obviously, NRT in combination with tobacco product to cut down. Absolutely, that's the next way. You could do a reduce to quit or just a reduction. Uh, one of the things with dual use, when people are using dual, you want to make sure that people aren't just using NRT when they can't smoke and then smoking when they can, because that's neither helping them quit or get move the, the needle. Uh, but what you really want them to know is with the NRT on how much reduction in smoking they're getting and and titrate the NRT accordingly. So so let's say in this in this in this individual you're smoking one pack a day, which is let's say it's a small pack of 20, rather, you know, a large pack is 25, small pack is 20. We give them a 21 milligram patch and it comes down to 10 cigarettes a day. So uh, Dr. Abdulaziz, you know, we've talked about this in the past. How would you approach that? So he comes back in follow up and is now down to 10 with one patch. What are some of the options we could we could recommend? So one would be like a short acting NRT or or like adding another patch. Yeah. Yeah, we could add another patch. We could add some of the short acting depending on his or, or both depending on that till he gets to zero cigarette. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn asked, is the reticulin lowest tolerance for alcohol and naltrex increases the alcohol tolerance, which may be a negative effect on the It's not, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Marilyn. Uh, you may want to clarify in the chat. We'll, we'll come back to it just in the interest of time. But, but it is something to keep in mind that uh, you need to take a biopsychosocial approach, motivation interviewing clearly to understand, understand what's driving the smoking, make sure there isn't depression, anxiety underlying this. Um, and, and if you're going to use pharmacotherapies, then these are the options that you just talked about, uh, that you could use. Okay. All right. I'm just going to move us on to the next case. Um, so yeah. Okay. Take so case, yeah. So case number three is a 60 year old traumatic brain injury with unsteady gait, severe memory impairment, mood disorder, substance use disorder, mainly cannabis, diabetes, family history of lung cancer, smoked 25 cigarettes per day for more than 35 years, was able to quit twice with intensive case management and one-to-one -one staff support for more than three months. However, that was not sustainable. Barriers mainly being memory impairment, impulsivity, and disconnect between, between what is said and what is done. Currently is smoking 10 cigarettes per day, still is offered case management to increase confidence. And for memory, the team has been doing noting, journaling, just to um, help with memory disturbance and allowing the client to remember what was discussed last, last week or the week before, has visual signs in his environment and statements of affirmation, like including coping statements and the reasons uh, he initially wanted to quit. So I think in this case, um, the team is doing a really good job, despite the very long list uh, problem list and like the complexity of the case. Okay. What are your thoughts, Dr. Selby, on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. The case submitted is really indication of so many issues. And one thing that I tell people, especially have been so involved in this in a very difficult case and the out is like the person hasn't, you know, quit. You often, we often feel like we haven't done enough for the person. Uh, and, you know, 
I tell every healthcare provider this, when you're feeling a disconnect, you're feeling you haven't done enough, the patient is showing up, then if it's possible and the person can actually respond to you, uh, I ask them the question, you know, you've been, Mr. X, you've been coming to the clinic X number of times for, and they have seen you, and I'd like to know from you what benefit you're getting from coming to see us. Because two things happen is they're reflecting on on what is benefiting from it. And, and that's really important for you to hear because there may be other benefits that you're not measuring. Uh, and secondly, when they reflect on it, it may be become apparent to both you and them that there's actually no benefit. They're just, they're just showing up because they thought you wanted them to come and you felt that you had to see them. Whereas it helps recalibrate whether treatment's working or not for this individual or what needs to be to change, or if in fact they need to move on to something else. And there's nothing wrong with that because sometimes it's not a fit, it doesn't work, uh, the treatment what we're doing is just not working. Having said that, you also have somebody who has a traumatic brain injury. And you know we work closely with uh, SUBI, Substance Use and Brain Injury Program at uh, here in Toronto, and it's really important to have an, an adaptation of your intervention for people who have uh, traumatic brain injury, because it depends on what the issues are. You know, there are there's been a lot of case series where people who've had traumatic brain injuries and have injured the insula, a certain part of the brain, they spontaneously stop smoking. But in other situations, what happens is there's disinhibition and impulsivity, as you say. So you get this disconnect between what is said and what is done. And it's not, uh, here's what happens, right? We will, uh, we will diagnose that as a lack of motivation or a lack of commitment, but what it actually is, a lack of ability. So, you know, in a way you wanna make sure that there's an external brain that, that can help the person uh, uh, figure this out. And in situations like this, the therapy and the communication has to be through multimodality. It's not just talking because sometimes that can become overwhelming. They're unable to process it. But it could be with the use of charts and sticky notes and reminders and, and, and clearing the environment of cigarettes so that those cues don't happen. But you also have cannabis in the mix. So, you know, is that oral cannabis or gummies or things like that or edibles or is it uh, is smoked cannabis? It's Again, smoked. Yeah. it's smoked cannabis. So, so, you know, things, thinking about ways to, to help figure that out. And again, is the cannabis causing the mood disorder or worsening the mood disorder that's helping? Is it causing cognitive impairments? So, so you know, and, and the good thing is this person has been able to quit in the past. Um, and so I think uh, you're doing everything you can. Um, in these situations, if there's no history of um, convulsions or seizures, then vernetoxone may be an option too, um, because it's more passive. It can be given under observation. You know, the person can take it and tolerate it. Um, but again, as we said, you know, motivation interviewing will only go so far, but it's really that external brain through intensive case management, one-on-one -on -one staff support, and, and and creating everything that they've done for now, which is helping the memory uh, with visual signs and statements of affirmation, et cetera. Uh, one last thing I would say is, you know, interventions in the social circle also may be necessary because who's supplying the cannabis, who's supplying the cigarettes, is there a social, uh, supply that's happening that needs to also you also need to do the intervention with. And lastly, uh, there are medications. There are some, sometimes the person on medications like antipsychotics, they tend to or opioids, they tend to increase that desire to 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 consume cigarettes. So that's tend to be the way I I would approach a, a situation like this. But you know, please feel free to add uh, your thoughts as well, uh, Dr. Disease. Yeah, absolutely. That's very well said, uh, Dr. Selby. I think, um, again, just uh, taking it one, one step at a time um, and looking back at what was done, I think uh, going down to 10 cigarettes per day is an achievement in itself. 
And yeah, just having self-compassion and self-validation of what was done is to be considered in uh, such situations as a, a healthcare professional. Mm. Okay. All right. So, I mean, who was uh, you know, exactly how does the client uh, consume cannabis? Yeah, absolutely, Tina. We want to know that. You want to disconnect it. Sometimes, as you know, when people smoke cannabis, they either mix tobacco in it or they are using it as a chaser after. So trying to disconnect those things is important. Uh, and again, uh, absolutely, NRT might help him. You could use NRT bupropion. You have to be careful again because of seizures. Uh, but yeah, NRT could be fine. Uh, combination, uh, certainly, uh, if they're willing, if he's willing to. Uh, but really, that environmental structure is what is needed. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go to the next uh, next case. There we go. Okay, so case four is around the idea of smoking cessation support for uh, smoke-free housing. So when we have a client who is not interested but is needed to quit smoking for housing or shelter reasons. Yeah, I know those those are challenging because they tend to have complex needs. They have, you know, both mental health and and sub other substance use issues, or they have cognitive issues, and it it is very difficult. Um, you know, it, it, clearly, who who can give consent if they can get consent, or if they have a substitute decision maker who gives consent. In these situations, really, we we try to limit the amount of cigarettes they have access to, or the money to buy cigarettes, and then obviously meet that nicotine hunger with nicotine replacement as much as possible. Um, we've tried to get some of these people uh, vaping devices, but again, that's a challenge, uh, not always successful. But in general, you know, there's not a whole lot uh, one can do uh, because uh, if somebody's not interested, we have to figure out what that is. Uh, is that because of cognitive issues uh, so lack of ability or really lack of you know, motivation and wanting to exercise their, their self-right. And I think in the last one, if they are completely well mentally and they are exercising their choice, then there's nothing much you can do other than engage them in motivation interviewing. Uh, if, if and when they'll engage in that um, and get them to see uh, what the housing issues are and what, you know, uh, for them. Um, yeah. Would you like to add anything to that or should we go to the next? No, I think we can go to the next. Yeah, just um, okay. considering more motivational interviewing in such cases just to learn more about the situation. So case five is on carceral or jail clients arriving to facilities without any treatment for tobacco use disorder. In the context when NRT is considered black market as a, a black market product, either being boiled or smoked, bupropion crushed and sniffed, and the misconception that veroniclin will cause or trigger psychosis. Yeah, I, I I think this is this has been a challenge actually. Clearly, in corrections and other places, what do you do? Um, now, if they're going to be transferred and are going to be in a facility, which is, and then I would treat them like anybody else in the facility, the issue becomes if they're going back to the those areas. And uh, I rightly said, NRT gums and inhalers and all of that can be considered black market patches. Uh, you know, anecdotally, we've heard of people trying to, you know, extract the nicotine from the patch and then try to, you know, uh, immerse uh, paper in it and then smoke the paper. Uh, but again, so all of those things become potential risks. You know, uh, nicotine gum is is a little risky. They can use it to, you know, jam things with and so. So if NRT is allowed and you're worried about uh, you know diversion or anything like that, the mouth spray might be a good one, but it cannot be self-administered. Somebody could use that spray and spray it into somebody's face, and those kinds of things are problematic. But the law, out of all of the products out there, the lozenge would probably be the best one to use if there is willingness to use it. Uh, we've heard of a history of bupropion being crushed and sniffed. Um, 
there is it's rare but there are people who do that and it is problematic in this population if if you have people who are wanting to inject a, a tablet if if there's a possibility of direct observed treatment uh, whereby they can be given the bupropion and it's swallowed and they can see that it's swallowed, then sure, then you can do that and you don't have to worry about it getting crushed and sniffed. But you need, you know, twice a day direct observed treatment. Uh, with respect to the verniclin can trigger cause psychosis, I think this requires a lot of education of the healthcare providers there about it. I don't think, you know, with the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it's hard. But, you know, we've used a guide for using verniclin in people with psychosis is that clearly, obviously, in, in people who've been incarcerated in jail, there's some high likelihood that their psychosis is not fully under control. So typically, we want, before we use verniclin in people with psychosis, they should be stable on that medication for at least six months. They should not be having relatively, you know, no apsychotic and, and, and otherwise fine uh, to be able to take Champix. So that's how we usually approach these kinds of patients. Um, Dr. Alshel, are there other ideas that you've been thinking about as you reviewed the case? Not really. So just more of education on venonicline and making you know better accessibility for that option in in such facilities. I think would would help one way or another. Yeah, and one of the things I say, if people are already incarcerated or under observation. Uh, you know, you you and and they can be observed. I mean, obviously this is difficult in the gym, but if it's in a in, you know in, inpatient program, that person has, but you know you've tried NRT, it's not working, and you want to give them renexlin, you can do direct observe treatment with renexlin and see if there's any worsening of psychosis. And it this idea that it triggers psychosis is kind of anecdotal that hasn't played itself out in over ten years of data. So. Uh, so that really that signal it seems to be idiosyncratic and you know depending on the the risk uh you may even try vernicillin in that population um under observation okay uh so marvel science of bupropion effectiveness in sniffing is it equally good as an oral medication so uh yeah people you sniff uh bupropion as a stimulant it's if you look at the structure of bupropion uh, it's a it's chemically very it's closely related to uh, amphetamine, uh, but it's modified so that it has much much lower uh, abuse liability. But if people are looking to you know get high and there's anything out there, they do uh, crush the ibuprofen, sniff it, and most often uh, either sniff it or inject it, and it is for that stimulant effect. So bupropion is a myostibulant and definitely will do that. But when you switch it over into injectable, it, becomes quite, it can become a powerful stimulant and, and, and you do see cases of uh, abuse of it. Uh, not very good for the veins, but, but people do do that. Um, and as an oral medication, you know, one in seven people who take bupropion for smoking cessation will quit. So it's quite pretty effective. It's not as effective as veronaclin or combination nicotine replacement, but it's effective. And certainly it's not something we should discard. Uh, it, it's in the treatment of depression, it's it's kind of a mild antidepressant. It's usually used as an augmenter to other antidepressants, but it is effective. Um, the issue now becomes whether it's going to be effective for uh, somebody like this. Uh, the risk benefit, depending on you know their general jail population versus you know uh, under observation the bupropion could potentially prove, prove to be harmful in this situation if they crush and sniff it, or they divert it to somebody else who crushes and sniffs it. Okay, um, moving along, uh, we're gonna go to uh, case number six. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. So case number six is basically on the idea of clinical inertia and schizophrenic patients that are not responding to NRT, what would be our other options to consider in that situation? Yeah, I, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, when you, you know, when we talk about this, when people with schizophrenia have what we call negative symptoms, where they seem lack of motivation, lack of interest, unable to, you know, follow through on things, um, 
executive functioning, etc., they may or may not have, you know, after some time, they tend not to have acute psychosis skills or positive symptoms. They're not paranoid, they're not hearing voices, or they're really not dominating, but this, this issue comes in um, where they are just not moving forward. And, and so I have a question for you, <coughs> Doctor. So what do you, when you, say, when you hear this, and say something is not responding to NRT, how are you usually thinking about it in the clinic? So number one would be just reviewing, you know, medication adherence. Are they actually putting the patches using the NRT or not? Um, do they have enough of it or not? Uh, so just going back to the basics initially and making sure that we're uh, on top of it in terms of adherence. Yeah. Clearly, are they, you know, are they not responding to me as medication adherence and then dosing? You know, we know people with schizophrenia tend to have, they tend to, we know that they have abnormal nicotinic receptors and they have a higher tolerance and they have a higher demand from cigarettes. Um, and so it's important to know, uh, one is what is the dose of NRT? The other thing is the antipsychotic medications they smoke, they they take also increase that desire to smoke. So you combine the social setting where they are, where everybody's smoking. You combine with the easy access to contraband cigarettes. You combine that with the biological issues. Uh, then our our treatment needs to be modified. You know, adherence may or may not be because of personal motivation. Adherence could simply be because if the person has less than optimal hygiene, the patches don't stick. Or they have, you know, so therefore it's not working because they don't have, you know, the patches don't last long enough. Or, or so those are the, some of the, you know, nuance when I, we unpack that not responding to NRT, it's finding out all these other things that could be coming in the way of response before we are, we jump to something else. Uh, so, you know, do adherence, the dose, uh, is it inadequate? Has there been any sort of reduction in nicotine consumption by cigarettes? If, if they, you know, and do they need higher doses of patches um, and short acting? So those are the kinds of things we'd start and then consider, you know, your options are whether you, you need to switch them to something else or you're gonna augment. Uh, so if they have coverage, would you like to just switch them to verenicline or would you like to have combination verenicline and nicotine replacement? And what are some of the considerations if we do do that, uh, Dr. Alshel? Yeah, so number one would be to consider augmenting if NRT is working and if we know that it's like dropping down the uh, average cigarettes per day. So I would consider augmenting with verenicline in that situation just because we know that they need more uh, nicotine replacement, but that can like add that extra edge of help that we are looking for. Yeah. If that's not working, maybe just completely shifting to varenicline. Yeah, and and of course, you know, there are studies that have shown, like it's you know that people who com combine nicotine replacement with varenicline have a higher quit rate, but they also may have more side effects. They may have more headache, they may have nausea, etc. But again, you know, we have another combination that we don't talk about so much, but uh, but certainly is a possibility is combining verenicline and bupropion together. Now, again, in somebody with schizophrenia, we want to make sure that they aren't on too many medications that lower that seizure threshold, that they haven't had a seizure, and that they aren't at risk of bipolar, you know, schizoaffective disorder where there's a mood component to their schizophrenia. Uh, but a combination of bupropion and renicone might be exactly what they need because the mild stimulant effect of the bupropion helps them be more alert, more you know, focused, and uh, has a little bit of effect on mood, but more importantly, helps their smoking cessation and also doesn't lead to, you know, it's one of the medications that has the least amount of weight gain while they're on it. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense to to option that. And then the renicone really is the big guns that help the quitting smoking. But there's one small study that shows the two together, not patients with schizophrenia, but those two together 
uh, are quite effective in helping people quit. Uh, the good thing is Ontario Drug Benefit allows you to prescribe both at the same time. So we can actually do that in Ontario if we need to. Uh, the other thing is obviously where are they living? You know, is that caseworker also smoking? Because that often has been a big issue in the dynamics of quitting smoking for people with schizophrenia. Uh, in many cases, we would, in those situations, offer the worker help as well separately. Um, and of course, their living situation of the home uh, clearly help uh, make sure that their living space also becomes tobacco free because, you know, it doubles the chances of being a, uh, successfully quitting. So work on the environment, work on the individual motivations, and then work on the pharmacotherapy, all of them sort of have to align uh, so this person can, can do better. Uh, it, it, I'm just going to say it because we also have to make sure that people with schizophrenia, for example, are also susceptible to other substances. So, you know, make sure you're checking on the alcohol consumption, make sure you're checking the cannabis consumption. These two are the big ones, other drugs as well. Um, and then, you know, another option I do consider with, with the, with patients with schizophrenia is because of the antipsychotics and the antipsychotic induced weight gain, you know, are they, are they candidates for other interventions that can help them, uh, you know, prevent diabetes, manage their weight gain, um, and still early days, we don't know if medication like semiglutide definitively reduce, reduce smoking, or it only affects alcohol consumption. But again, these are early days, and so we would go with more evidence-based before we went to, uh, you know, uh, uh, semiglutide or uh, those kinds of medications. Um, and of course, lastly, as we've said, you know, is if everything else, you've tried everything, then the most harm reduction option is a pod based vaping device. Uh, it's a lot cheaper than, than smoking, unless, of course, they're getting contraband when all bets are off. So, any other comments that you'd like to make, Dr. Alshail, about your approach? Well, I think we covered all aspects of this uh, kind of situation from like a biopsychosocial approach. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we we went through these four cases. Um, you know, as you step back, what are your reflections and what are some of the cases that you're seeing, Dr. Azeen, in the clinic that, that make you think about uh, yeah, the approach and what might benefit the people who've joined our call today. Yeah, so one thing that I would start considering more is augmenting with NRT on top of baroniclin. That's something that's not quite often happening, but uh, I've seen good results with that. So that's something I would consider. I wasn't sure why wasn't baroniclin working in some cases. Mm -hmm. but something, um, I would consider more often when Berenicline is not really doing the job. Yeah. Yeah, and especially have, you know, even people with, so Berenicline, as people know, can be used in people with pretty much every, you know, unless they're allergic to it, you don't, you you could use it. Uh, you have to have be cautious, you have to reduce the dose by half if they have very compromised liver, uh, kidney function. But other than that, really, um, we, we, as a group, need to increase our use of vernacular. We tend not to use it as much and make sure that people take it for the full 12 weeks, et cetera. Um, uh, anything else? Um, um, other things that I would uh, share with everyone is, you know, the fear of patches or like patch side effects, having anxiety and tackling that, because I've faced that a couple of times in the clinic. You know, mm -hmm. clients getting NRT going back, but not really putting the patches on because of, you know, consistent fear of having side effects or like experiencing nicotine toxicity. Yeah. And so in the clinic, we always educate people about what it looks like nicotine toxicity. And with people who smoke and uh, on the patch, I've never seen it. Where I do hear case reports of nicotine toxicity and from patients is when they've try to switch over to vaping and they don't realize that they're over vaping because they don't have a visual cue that the you know, cigarette is done. And then they'll say, you know, yeah, by the end of the day, I've got a kind of headache and I've got nausea and I feel kind of weak. And then that is nicotine toxicity, you know, but uh, for the most part, 
you have to educate people uh, about it. Um, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? I think there's a question in the chat from Tracy about when do we consider the combination. Uh, I think this is a you know this is a great question. It's a lot of clinical work, so I pay attention to one. You know, what's the patient's history? Have they have they tried each of those individuals alone, had partial responses, and nothing, and, and but weren't able to quit? Then yeah, absolutely, and there's no contraindication. Then go for it because they've done you know they've done stuff before, and and it hasn't you know they've had a partial responders. So uh, NRT again, if they've uh, Really, uh, you know, the factors around uh, accessibility. Cost is another big reason. I mean, the best one that people will respond to are the ones that people are willing to take and if they can pay for it, willing to pay for it. So that's how my, so it's not very scientific, but that's my approach to how, you know, when we are going to do this, there isn't any good evidence uh, or adaptive trials that have shown Oh yeah, you know what? If this is clearly first line, and if it doesn't work, here's what you should do: second line. It's a little unclear. It's more expert opinion, and uh, and clearly, it, you know, it's patient preference and expert opinion, and and just the pragmatics of it that you decide whether you're going to go combination or switch. Um, Sandrine asked about zonic nicotine patches. They have been authorized in Canada as uh, you know, it, it comes from a tobacco company, and uh, we're going to have to see what happens if, if it does, uh, you know, if it does make it. Uh, if people are, and I'm curious what other people have, have they had? We, I haven't had anybody um, uh, come in yet uh, with the nicotine, uh, uh, the Zonic uh, uh, pouches, and um they are licensed in Canada as a form of nicotine replacement to quit uh, smoking. Uh, so, you know, um, it, it is something to think about. Uh, we do have um, these, there are market, you know, we live in a brave new world. So uh, people are going to use it. And, and the question is whether it's priced more accessible or not. Um, we haven't, has anybody seen people using? Uh, uh, Zonic yet? I, I, please chat. Yeah, I haven't seen it. We're we're waiting to see it. I mean, when we were I, when I was out west, I heard some people talking about it um, uh, for youth trying it. But again, it doesn't sound like they're trying to use it for quitting smoking. So I, you know, it's hard to know. Um, yeah. yeah. Then nicotine toxicity with NRT inhaler excess use very hard, right? Because a nicotine inhaler uh, is orally absorbed. It's a very heavy form of nicotine. You have to puff back at it for 20 minutes to get the full, you know, two even though it says four milligrams, two milligrams is delivered and one milligram is absorbed. So it takes a lot. Uh, so I think by the time, you know, it takes 20 minutes, by the time, unless somebody's, you know, somehow trying to do two, uh, two cartridges at the same time. I, you know, I haven't seen it. Um, again, where they can get toxicity is is if they let's say they are on two patches and then they use the inhaler on top of that. Yes, maybe, but I haven't seen it. Um, okay. Mm, and uh, Rupali asked, have, have patients who reduce with twenty one milligram patch down to ten and feel nervous about stepping down patch concentration? How do you wean down NRT effectively? So that's a great question. Generally, if people are still smoking on the patch, the, the going down is not the way. We have to keep going up till they have at least four weeks of not smoking before you start considering bringing the patch down. Often the issue that is happening at that stage where there's a reduction and not uh, going, it's, it's typically because they are feeling very attached to the cigarette. They're afraid to let go of the last cigarettes and a lot of counseling is required about moving on from cigarettes and, and, and giving up cigarettes. So it's really not necessarily pharmacotherapy, it's pharmacotherapy plus this attachment. Uh, so our approach is to have that conversation, increase the patch uh, till they report that they can smoke on it, that they're not able to finish their cigarettes on it, or they're finding their cigarettes tasting awful, 
And then when they get at least four weeks without smoking, uh, then then look at uh, uh, weaning down in NRT. And and weaning down in NRT, there's no uh, there's no science to it. It's all art. Uh, it's what people can tolerate. There are people who are you know 42 milligrams of nicotine. They stop it completely and have no withdrawal. And those there are people who you drop even you know a, a few milligrams and will complain of withdrawal. But typically, you're going down by seven milligrams. You're using NRT as rescue, uh, the short acting as rescue, but you don't want them to you know land up compensating with too many rescues because then you're going too quickly. So if they're using an NRT lozenge once or twice when they're catering, that's fine. Uh, when they're tapering, that's fine. But anything more than that, it means the tapering should be held off. Uh, because they're just simply compensating by increasing the NRT. Um, yeah, and, and and do you have patients um, who, I mean, Abdul Aziz, have you seen anybody like this? They, they feel they're getting too much NRT, but actually their nicotine would draw. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, do, I do see that frequently, and we do spend a lot of time reassuring, educating, and you know, um, advising clients to feel more more comfortable having the patches on, and then like trying to differentiate different symptoms, either you know toxicity versus withdrawal. Yeah, yeah, I I think that's it. I I just go over the list of nicotine withdrawal symptoms, and I ask them to correlate it to their use of the NRT. So, for example. You know, they say, okay, I put on the patch in the morning. I'm anxious before I put it on, but then as the day goes on, I feel better, but then I'm anxious towards the end of the day. That's more likely to be withdrawal versus the person who says, I feel fine. I put the patch on and then at two hours in, I'm feeling sick and weak and tired and nauseous and headache. And then if I take the patch off, I feel better. Well, then, yeah, that's a peak effect of nicotine toxicity. Uh, so that's how I help people understand, uh, based on the NRT that they're using, where they're getting, uh, you know, withdrawal or not getting withdrawal. So now we have a, a few more minutes left, and I want to make sure we get you out on time because it is the middle of the week. Uh, we the great topics in the chat about being uh, Zonic being sold out. I think we will need to do see, pay closer attention. Uh, but the the interesting thing about uh, Zonic is they have gum and they have these pouches as well. So. You know, we have to make sure that this is not one of those product interference things that people uh, are able to distinguish one from the other. Uh, and we'll end with Denise's last question. If somebody has spoke two packs a day and has tried the patches but unable to use, they do use a lodges and health, but would it be safe amount of days for lodges and this client can use? So I think, uh, Denise, your question is really good. If they can't tolerate NRT uh, patches, you know, it's, if it's a one-to-one -one, uh, um, substitution because don't forget, you're giving on average one milligram of nicotine absorbed from the lozenge, and they're getting anywhere from 0.5 to five milligrams absorbed from a cigarette. So, you know, if you instruct them only when you have withdrawal, you put a lozenge in your mouth and you're comfortable, then that's a one-to-one, -one and it can be up to 16 and you know you can go up to 20, uh, depending on what they need. Uh, on the other hand, if it's so many lozenges, they may be better off with this level of dependence to switch to vernaclin or bupropion or combination there. Um, and actually, one last, I, I, uh, LK had uh, had a question. Uh, if people are not responding to the patch, uh, are there any concerns of nicotine toxicity? Look, nicotine toxicity will happen very quickly if people are are, are smoking on the patch. And if they aren't getting toxicity the, and they're not reducing, then the patch is not working. It's best to switch to something else. So, you know, the hour has gone by us very quickly. Uh, I really want to talk, uh, thank Dr. Abdul Aziz uh, for, 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 you know, being here and for commenting on the cases and, and, and sharing his experience in the clinic um, over the last several months since March. Uh, I want to thank Natalie for uh, obviously, uh, you know, hosting us and getting this going. And uh, I'd be remiss in not thanking uh, Julia Baxter, uh, who works at our, in the Intrepid Lab, who helped with uh, getting the slides together for us. And to all of you for your comments, for sending in the cases, and uh, we, uh, we wish you a great uh, rest of day. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Peter and Dr. Ashale. Um, yeah, if anyone needs to head out, please do. Thank you for kind of ending us off, Peter. I'll just go through a few reminders and housekeepers for, uh, housekeeping items for those that are interested. Um, so just a reminder um, that you're welcome to find an archive list of our previous TEACH webinars on our website if you're interested in reviewing or sharing with any colleagues. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining. It, as a reminder, if you're interested in receive, uh, receiving a letter of completion for this uh, TEACH educational rounds, make sure uh, to complete the uh, post-learning assessment that will be emailed to you by the end of tomorrow. Um, and just a heads up about our next webinar on November 15th, um, who will be presented by Dr. Osma Melamed on the Women Mind Project. So look out for registration coming up shortly. Uh, for now, that I believe that should be everything. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining and have a great rest of your day. Bye, y'all.